As Bitcoin continues its inexorable climb, privacy will become the next great battleground. And for an example of some of the excellent tools that are being made available to Bitcoin users, today we're going to be looking at Sparrow Wallet and the privacy tools that it has integrated from the Samurai Wallet team. Let's jump in. Welcome back to another video. My name is Ian Major. I'm an entrepreneur, Bitcoin pleb, and all around raging capitalist. And today I am filming this on October 20th, and Bitcoin is absolutely shredding faces out there. You love to see it, but this also underscores the importance of privacy. As Bitcoin continues to become more and more valuable over time, there will inevitably be more and more surveillance attempted on this space. And if you've been watching this channel for any length of time, you know that I believe firmly that privacy is an individual's fundamental right. And that's why I'm very excited today to be doing this video. We're going to be going into Sparrow Wallet uh, and I've done a basic tutorial on this that I will uh, put in the description down below. Uh, so if you're brand new to Sparrow Wallet, I would encourage you to check that out first. But today we're going to be focusing on the privacy features that have been embedded. And these are tools from the Samurai Wallet team, which we'll talk about. Very, very exciting stuff to see this type of collaboration. Uh, and I think this is going to uh, make a big difference. So plan for today, I'm going to talk briefly about just the overall context behind uh, coin joining or coin mixing, um, you know, what it does, what it doesn't do, uh, and some also some kind of cautionary words about it. And then we're going to jump into the walkthrough itself and take a look at what all of this looks like within Sparrow Wallet. For those returning to the channel, welcome back, my friends and fellows. It is great to have you as always. And for those new to the channel, and I know there are many of you, about 80% of you watching, in fact, are currently not subscribed. And so if you like this content, I invite you to consider subscribing and join us in our merry gang in cyberspace. I cover all manner of Bitcoin related content, including wallet tutorials like this, uh, more technical subjects, um, running your own node, DeFi on Bitcoin, news analysis, high level stuff. Uh, you want it, I cover it. That is the name of the game here. And so if that sounds interesting to you, I invite you to come along. But nonetheless, with all that out of the way, let's jump into the meat for today. And again, I'm gonna start with just some high level overview before we get into the walkthrough. All right, so the motivation for this should hopefully be fairly uh, clear to most folks watching this, I think. But just to kind of underscore the point, you need to look no further than some of the you know mainstream headlines that are coming out. Um, you know, as an example from the U.S., Janet Yellen and you know the Treasury wants to track every transaction that you make over six hundred dollars, and so your bank would have to you know document this. Um, there's more and more and more surveillance that's going to be rolled out, and there's a very simple reason for this, right? Um, you know, yes, your government hates you. That's uh, a fact. But they are in fairly desperate shape. Um, most governments around the world are so indebted to the point where it is completely and utterly um, unsustainable, right, at this point. And so they're kind of treading this very fine line where they have to keep nominal GDP going up. You know, they have to pretend to the bond market that everything's okay and that they're not going to hyperinflate, uh, you know, the currency and keep printing money, to, right? Like, they're in very, very tricky shape, central banks and, and governments around the world. And in such a context, what they need is more surveillance and control over their citizens and how their citizens are spending and using money. It's really as simple as that. Um, and we're going to see more of that, uh, make no mistake. And so what I'm about to cover in these, you know, in this video, and I've covered it in others, uh, are not means by which to conduct illicit activities, um, but rather I believe everyone has the right to privacy, right? Um, you know, it's no one's business what you do with your money as long as you're not violating the rights uh, of, of others. Um, it's, a, it's really as simple as that. And so coin joins or coin mixing becomes a really powerful tool in the privacy toolkit when talking about Bitcoin. And so let's break down what it actually is. As you can see in this diagram, 
a coin join really is intended to obfuscate and disassociate the ownership of inputs to outputs in a Bitcoin transaction. What does that mean? That means that uh, you know if I'm coming into this transaction with several other individuals and we're all putting kind of equal uh, amounts into this transaction as inputs, and then what's happening in between is a number of techniques, um, typically of the kind of Chaumian variety, that are disassociating and making it extremely difficult for chain surveillance to figure out which outputs are associated uh, with which inputs. And so practically what this means, and what it let's talk about what it does and doesn't do, what it does do is make it extremely difficult on a go forward basis for any entity surveilling the blockchain to know that this particular output is associated with this particular uh, kind of input. Um, and there's a variety of ways that chain surveillance firms uh, sort of trace those inputs to an individual, to an identity. Um, this could be, this is why it's really important actually to run uh, your own node. You know, anytime that you are uh, using someone else's node, you're conveying information such as your balances, um, you know, uh, other information such as your IP address, things like that, that can be, uh, you know, kind of traceable. And so that's what CoinJoin does. What CoinJoin doesn't do is, of course, erase the past. So if you're buying Bitcoin on Coinbase, you know, you're giving all your information to Coinbase. And so Coinbase knows that you bought X amount over whatever time frame. And so this will never erase that record and that fact, uh, but it will make it extremely difficult to say that on a go forward basis, um, you know, it, it, it sort of severs the deterministic link between inputs and outputs. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, one conceptual analogy to this is imagine, you, you know, someone's uh, looking for you, right? Someone's trying to find you. And so, you know, if you're just kind of standing there in the open, pretty easy to do, right? And that's essentially what the blockchain uh, is. But if you're surrounding yourself with others, it becomes a little harder to spot you. Um, now, if all of you are now wearing the exact same thing, you know, getting some V for Vendetta vibes here, like if you all have the same mask and the same clothes, then it becomes really hard to pick you out. And that's kind of conceptually what is happening. Now, there are a number of CoinJoin implementations uh, on the market, uh, one of which is Whirlpool from Samurai Wallet. Um, this is free and open source, non-custodial uh, that has uh, option that has been embedded within Sparrow Wallet. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Uh, there is also Wasabi Wallet, which is very excitingly coming out with their Wasabi Wallet 2.0, uh, which includes the revamped Wabi Sabi CoinJoin implementation. Uh, I've done a whole video on this just kind of in anticipation of this launch. And so it's a pretty great time to be a Bitcoin user uh, with some of these privacy tools uh, at our disposal. And then there's also uh, Join Market. Um, Join Market is one of the older in the sense that, you know, they've been around uh, for quite some time. And each of these has a slightly different flavor that they take. Uh, I'm not in this video going to go through pros and cons uh, of, of each of these although that could be a good topic for a future video. So given that the focus of today's video is going to be on uh, Sparrow and the Samurai privacy tools that are embedded uh, within there, let's talk just very briefly about Samurai's overall approach to this. So they actually have a pretty unique um, kind of fee structure. They do uh, fixed fees associated with different pool sizes, and you can see that breakdown here. So you basically have uh, four different pool sizes corresponding to 0 0.001 Bitcoin, 0 0.01 Bitcoin, 0 0.05 Bitcoin, and 0.5 Bitcoin. And you can see the kind of minimums and maximums. And what's really interesting is there's this flat pool fee, and you can see how that varies across the different pools. So basically what happens, um, this is again, the it's called Whirlpool, um, is you know, you'd, you'd pick the appropriate pool, and there's pros and cons. You may say, oh, well, I'm gonna go to the pool that has the lowest fixed fees, well, if you have a ton of Bitcoin that you're going to mix, like that may not be the right option because if you have half a Bitcoin that you're going to mix and you go to the 0 0.001 pool, you're going to have many, many, many uh, different UTXOs that that will get chunked into. Like your half a Bitcoin will get chunked into 0 0.001 uh, sized UTXOs. And so um, as we'll discuss, 
you know, dealing with that many UTXOs and the fact that you don't really want to recombine UTXOs after you've done the mixing would make that potentially pretty unwieldy. So there's pros and cons, right? What's really nice about this is once you pay that uh, kind of fixed fee, as well as the um, minor fees for the initial transaction that kind of initializes all this, you can keep your UTXOs mixing for however long you want, um, which I think is a, a really nice uh, part of this. The other really important concept here is how Samurai's Whirlpool uh, uses your wallet's sort of account and address space. And so this is pretty clever. What they basically do is they create different silos within your wallet uh, that allows you to kind of manage this process and make sure that you're not undoing some of the privacy gains that you have generated. So for example, these are the different components that are um, created once you initialize the Whirlpool client. So your wallet will basically have a deposit section, and this is kind of your like default where you would receive Bitcoin into this wallet. Uh, next, so once you initialize the Whirlpool, we'll send the sats to what's called a premix section of the wallet. Um, and this is basically where funds are going to sit waiting to join a mix. And so then one of your UTXOs that's sitting in this premix will get randomly chosen to participate in a mix. And after that UTXO has been mixed for the first time, it will move to a third section, which is called the post mix. And so this is basically where you can do those free remixes for as long as the Whirlpool client is online. Um, and what's, uh, what's nice about how they've built this into Sparrow is that um, you can even like shut Sparrow off, you know, you can turn the mixing off, shut Sparrow off, and then come back in and kind of reinitialize the, uh, uh, the remixes from your post mix wallet. And then lastly, you have this bad bank section. Um, it says not currently used. I think this is just an older, uh, an older um, image of this because uh, it is used in the Sparrow uh, implementation. Uh, but basically, this is where your, uh, your doxic or your toxic uh, change goes. So for example, let's say that you have, um, you know, 1.1 Bitcoin, and you are pushing that through the 0.5 Bitcoin pool. Uh, that means that you will have two 0.5 size uh, UTXOs that are going to be mixed. But that also means that you have this 0.1 leftover as change. And so that change is toxic in the sense that, um, you know, you don't want to mix that change with your mixed UTXOs because that will undo all the privacy gains that you just gained. And so there is a, sec a separate section for your uh, doxic change. Um, and you know, you could kind of, you could start a new mix from that, for example. There's also a spending tool called Stonewall that I will go into in the walkthrough. Now, the final thing I wanna mention before we jump into the actual walkthrough is just a quick cautionary tale. So uh, it is the case that we've started to see certain third-party platforms. I think Coinbase is one of them. Uh, I'm going to link in the description a resource that is, um, I believe, tracking when these instances occur. But um, there have been cases where these platforms have reached out to a user who has deposited Bitcoin in this platform, let's say Coinbase as an example. Uh, and Coinbase will reach out to this user and say, hey, so-and-so, like, it appears to us that uh, these, you know, this these sats that you've deposited have been mixed. Like, what's the deal? And so this is really interesting, right? Um, my understanding thus far is that most of these instances are kind of inquiries, uh, but there have been uh, outright examples of platforms refusing to allow uh, mixed Bitcoin. And this opens up a massive, you know, kind of uh, question, right? Like this is the whole one key element of the Bitcoin value proposition is censorship resistance. And so anytime you're dealing with third parties uh, and intermediaries within this um, ecosystem, you know, you can face censorship. And so it's really discouraging to see. And so unfortunately there are going to be third parties that um, uh, enact policies like this. And so I just want you to be aware of that so that you can make an informed judgment for yourself. 
My belief is that the market will always provide solutions that don't care, as they rightly shouldn't care, about uh, about mixed sats. Um, but you know, you may, for example, want to hedge this, and perhaps you mix a portion of your stack, and then you leave a, another portion unmixed in case, for whatever reason, you know, you need to cash out for a medical emergency, right? Like things do happen, um, you know, that would that would potentially require this. Uh, and I would also just encourage you to get used to some of the peer-to-peer uh, Bitcoin exchanges like BISC, like HODL HODL, um, you know, that certainly would not, uh, you know, you wouldn't run into these issues. So just a cautionary tale. We are starting to see this and I suspect we will honestly see more of this um, as we go forward and as regulators attempt to surveil things ever more closely. But with that, let's go ahead now and jump into the walkthrough. All right, gang. So we are in Sparrow Wallet. We are in uh, Sir Mix a lot here, and we're going to take a look at how to mix our Sats that we have. So this is a brand new wallet. I've loaded it up with 300,000 Sats uh, for purposes of this video. Uh, again, if you're completely unfamiliar with Sparrow, uh, check out my um, other video that I will link in the description down below where you can see everything from scratch. Uh, but this video will kind of uh, build on that and go into some of the privacy tools. So what we wanna do is come over to our UTXOs tab on the left. Now I send these 300,000 sats all in one fell swoop. And so this has come in as a single UTXO or unspent transaction output. Uh, but you could have you know many uh, UTXOs. And so you can select whichever UTXOs you want, you can select multiple of them. And now what we want to do is come down and hit and say mix selected. So this is what initializes the Whirlpool client that is embedded within Sparrow. And so you can see Whirlpool configuration mixing coin join is provided in Sparrow through the Samurai Whirlpool coordinator. Um, Sparrow contains a Whirlpool client which communicates with the coordinator using blinded inputs. So this means the coordinator, uh, which is essentially just a server that is doing the mixing and facilitating the mixing, uh, is blinded in the sense that it doesn't know, uh, it can't read these inputs. Uh, as such, the privacy of your UTXOs is unchanged when using the service, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, it also says the fees for using the Whirlpool service are deducted from the UTXOs that you mix. And these include the fixed Whirlpool fee that we were just discussing and the minor fees required for the transactions. So let's go ahead and hit next. And you can see this uh, breakdown of those different um, uh, kind of uh, wallets within this overall wallet. So we'll have the premix created, we'll have the postmix, and we'll have the bad bank as we were discussing earlier in the video. Now, occasionally Samurai um, releases S codes. And so these are basically discounts for, um, you know, getting, uh, getting a discount. In fact, I know they just recently did one, although I think that window has closed. And so uh, you can follow them on Twitter, you know, and, and occasionally they will release one of these codes that you can put in. Since we do not have one, we will pay the full, uh, full amount. We'll go ahead and hit next. And so now it is presenting me with the option to select whatever pool I want based on the size of my uh, UTXO. And so the size of my UTXO is quite small. And so you will see that the only available pool option to me is the 0.001 uh, pool size. The anonymity set means how many participants are going to be in each mix. So there are five UTXOs that will be in each mix. Uh, I'm going to link in the description a very deep dive article from Samurai on anonymity sets if you are so curious to kind of dig into the gory uh, details and, and math. I think it's pretty interesting. And then you'll see this fixed pool fee of 5,000 sats. So that is what I will pay for the ability to use this service. And it's saying how, the number of premix outputs I will get is two UTXOs. Now you might think, well, wait a second, why wouldn't you get three since you have 0.003? And of course it's because of the fees, right? So I only have um, two 0.001 sized UTXOs that will get mixed. 
And then the rest will be used either for the fees in this case or returned to me in toxic change that will go in my bad bank uh, section of the wallet. So let's go ahead and hit preview premix. And this will now take us to the send tab. And so it's allowing us to now visualize uh, everything that's going to, to happen. So there's the Whirlpool fee we can see of 5,000 sats. There's the bad bank change. So I will, be, I will have 86,000 sats returned to me uh, as change. And then I will have um, these two premix uh, piles of sats. And you can see that they're not quite 100,000 sats. And the reason is because that extra 2,722 sats is what's going to pay the Bitcoin miner fees. So let's go ahead and it should be doing a fairly intelligent job here of, um, uh, of putting in the fees. You can see that this is actually quite high, 13.7 sats uh, per virtual byte, uh, given that the mempool is quite active today, given that Bitcoin is on a rampage. Um, but uh, this should all now be set. It's just, again, breaking it down for you. And so I will now say broadcast premix transaction. All right, so after the transaction broadcast, you'll be um, brought back to the send tab with kind of all the details wiped. And now you'll see on the right-hand side, you'll see these four tabs. So I've got the deposit tab, and you'll see that we've now, uh, Sir Mixalot has started to go. Um, so we've got a new mempool transaction to the tune of 300,000 sats. And so if I go to my transactions tab here, I can see that unconfirmed transaction that we just broadcast. So that is good. And so let's give this uh, transaction some time to confirm and then we'll come back and break down what's happening. All right, so you can see some, uh, some different things happening. So it can be the case that, um, so let, let's just kind of rewind. We put the UTXOs through the mixer. Um, we got some toxic change returned to the bad bank. And then the rest will go to the premix tab. Now, this should happen as soon as that initial transaction out gets a confirmation. Um, so in theory, you should see the following steps. You know, you initialize the mix, you get a confirmation, which will show up on the deposit tab. And then you should see the various UTXOs get propagated to premix as well as bad bank. Now for this one, I oddly had a bit of a delay on the premix. Um, and so I, I don't think you're probably supposed to do this because it disconnects the Whirlpool client, but I did um, kind of disconnect and then sort of toggle to make sure my node was fully, uh, fully connected. And so that brought things back into sync. So just, just be aware you could run into that, but it should be pretty uh, seamless. I've done this a number of times uh, and I've never seen that. But uh, we've actually already gotten one of our premix UTXOs that has rapidly moved th uh, through into postmix. Uh, and we can see if we hover over this um, progress bar, we can see that our remaining uh, UTXO has joined a mix. And so you can kind of you know, measure the progress. Uh, it'll basically register this input, uh, join a mix. And then the thing, like the mix itself happens extremely quickly. What you are waiting for are the other participants who are going to uh, participate in that mix. So let's go check on our other UTXO that has uh, rapidly moved through into our post mix. And you can now see here is that unconfirmed uh, transaction into our post mix tab. And if I go to the UTXOs tab, I can indeed see uh, my UTXO, which now has one mix next to it. And so once this has a confirmation, this will continue mixing. And so the key thing to be aware of is pre mix UTXOs will get picked up more quickly than post mix UTXOs. Why is this? So the Whirlpool uh, sort of logic is bringing in five UTXOs to participate in a mix. And I believe at least one to two of which, or one to two of which has to be new liquidity, meaning UTXOs that have not been seen before. 
because if you're just mixing the same, you know, UTXOs in a mixing bowl over and over, you're not adding that much more incremental privacy gains. Um, and so that's why you are typically going to see your premix UTXOs get grabbed very quickly because there are way fewer premix UTXOs than postmix UTXOs because imagine all the people who are just letting their uh, postmix UTXOs continue to mix, you know, forever and ever. Um, and so there's a, there's a big kind of pool of postmix UTXOs, uh, particularly depending on the pool size that you are in. And the UTXO selection itself happens randomly. And the other critical point of that is that it's the premix UTXOs that pay the minor fees. So that's uh, also an important uh, part of this, and that is what enables the free remixes. Basically, it's the new liquidity that is going to um, pay the fees. Now, this is uh, this is nice. We just saw in real time uh, our input was rejected, um, so that can sometimes happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, a, a, a peer may have disconnected. You know, depending on how you're connected. So right now, I've got my Sparrow connected to my node, and so if there's any kind of intermittent connectivity. Uh, you may risk having an input rejected from around. That is okay. You can always kind of stop and restart the mixing process. Um, but this this should just uh, resolve itself if I give it enough time. Um, and so just be aware that you know you may see you may see uh, mixes fail uh, either because your inputs are rejected for whatever reason. Um, or it may say something like mix failed and that could be, uh, perhaps because of one of the other participants, you know, got disconnected or somehow. So just be advised that like this can take some time and the best thing is to be patient. Uh, keep in mind that you do need to keep your Sparrow wallet open um, in order for the client to run. And so, you know, if you're mixing a bunch of UTXOs, just, just be advised it could take some time and you'll need to let that run. Uh, a lot of people will ask, well, how many mixes is like quote unquote good? Um, the thing to be aware of is uh, e even one mix is significantly better than zero mixes. That's great. Uh, but then you get exponentially better with each incremental mix. Um, I mean, general rule of thumb, I think like three would be a good sort of bare minimum to shoot for. Um, but keep in mind, like you could literally just let these UTXOs continue mixing, you know, however long you want. Um, but one of the use cases here is, you know, folks will typically want to, or often, if they're not just gonna let the UTXOs continue mixing, you know, however long, uh, they wanna mix a certain number of times before putting it into cold storage. So maybe you bought, you, you know, some sats off of a KYC exchange, uh, you wanna mix it and then throw it into cold storage, never to see the light of day again. And so that that would be a scenario in which you have some you know specified number that you want to mix to uh, before putting it into cold storage. Now on that note, there's a number of different ways you could do that. So let's pretend that we had a confirmation on this transaction already. What you would do is select this UTXO and then send it. Or rather, that's one way you could do it. However, the better way to do it, just to make sure that you don't recombine any UTXOs that you've just mixed is to actually do this mix to option at the bottom left. And so what this would allow you to do, if I click on this, um, if you had another Sparrow wallet open, so another tab up here, um, and again, watch my original Sparrow video that I'll link in the description, uh, because Sparrow supports you know read-only hardware wallets as well. So you can sort of import your, you know, your cold card or your foundation devices passport or, uh, you know, there are others that are supported. And so let's say that I had my, you know, uh, my foundation devices passport wallet linked and up here in another tab, I would be able to select this from the mix to wallet. Of course, I don't have any option here because I don't have that open. And then you can specify the number of minimum mixes you want and say restart Whirlpool. And so then what's gonna happen is each of your UTXOs will be mixed that number of times and then moved directly to your uh, other wallet. And this is a superior way to 
uh, spend your post mix UTXOs than just kind of ma manually selecting it and, and sending it. Um, and again, the principle here is you don't want to recombine. Let's say that you know our second UTXO gets mixed, and now we have two UTXOs. If I were to spend both of those mixed UTXOs together in a single transaction, I've now combined or recombined these UTXOs, which erodes some of the privacy benefits. And so you want to kind of treat each of these UTXOs distinctly after they've been mixed. And within Bad Bank, you'll see I have a UTXO as well. Now, this is not enough to start a mixing uh, process because it's too small for even the smallest pool. Uh, but let's say I did this you know, a number of times. I deposited new funds uh, to this wallet. The way I would do that is by going to the deposit tab and then generating a receive address. And so in the new funds come, uh, and then we would kick off and initialize mixing just the same as we did by going to the UTXOs tab, selecting it, and then uh, mixing that. And that would generate yet more bad bank. And so eventually you might have enough in the bad bank to where you could uh, you know, kick off a mix for just that. All right, so that covers mixing. I want to just quickly show one last uh, privacy feature within Sparrow. Uh, and it is the Stonewall post-mix spending tool. Um, so this is pretty nice. And in fact, it's, it doesn't even have to be post-mix. I think you can apply this even to an unmixed UTXO, which is really nice. Uh, I've opened up another wallet um, just so we don't have to wait for the confirmation on uh, Sir Mix-a-Lot. And so as we can see, I have this post-mix UTXO. This UTXO has gone through two mixes. Uh, and let's say that you know I'm fine with that and I want to go ahead and send this UTXO and only this UTXO, so I'm not recombining it with anything else, uh, to some address. What I can do is click it and then hit send selected. And this will bring you to the familiar send interface. And so you could put in the address, label it, specify your fees as you wish, and then you'll notice this option at the bottom. By default, if you're spending out of your post-mix uh, wallet, it will have privacy checked. And so this privacy option corresponds to the Stonewall process. And so I'll throw up this uh, diagram that essentially shows what Stonewall is doing. It's essentially simulating a two-person coin join transaction. Um, and this is to kind of introduce doubt or confusion between the link of inputs and outputs. Um, the key point here is that you have to spend less than half of the uh, balance for that UTXO. And so back to our example here, what I would actually need to do in this case is reduce the amount that I'm sending so that the Stonewall transaction can take place. So it needs to be less than half this amount um, and also needs to take into account the fees. So for, for example, let's just say that I, you know, the fees associated with this transaction are a thousand sats, I'm just making this up. Uh, and so what that means is if I subtract that thousand sats off of the 100,000 uh, UTXO, I would only be able to send 99,000 divided by two uh, sats in this actual transaction because what it's going to do is going to basically take double the amount of sats that I'm actually sending and use the you know use that double to kind of masquerade this transaction as if it was a um, sort of two you know person coin join um, so I hope that makes sense generally speaking you know you if you're if you're kind of spending an individual UTXO like this particularly if it's post mix you know, I would definitely recommend doing the uh, Stonewall transaction. Really, the only thing your uh, the only cost here is going to be a higher fee uh, because the transaction is going to be a more complex one. So, because the transaction is larger than a typical transaction, uh, the the fees are going to be a little bit higher. Um, but again, you know, probably a good trade off. This is also a good way to consolidate UTXOs if you absolutely have to um, without kind of fully losing you know, all, all privacy. 
Um, the, the other alternative is this efficiency tab. And it says privacy may be lost. It is recommended to optimize for privacy, especially when sending coin joined outputs. Uh, and so it's nice that that uh, kind of notice comes up. But efficiency is just sort of norm, you know, normally sending. It's sending uh, the transaction to minimize the size um, in terms of in data of the transaction so that it takes up as little space as possible in the transaction. Um, and keep in mind, you have this toggle even in uh, even if I was to go to you know my deposit tab and try to send unmixed UTXOs, you would still have this toggle, which is nice. All right, so we've covered mixing. Uh, we've covered the kind of do's and don'ts. Uh, we've also looked at this handy Stonewall spending tool that is also built in here. Let's go ahead and wrap this video up. All right, my friends, there you have it. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, I think that was warranted for this topic. We first started with just the basic concepts. What is coin join? What is coin mixing? Uh, what's the current landscape in terms of these you know, couple of uh, popular implementations? Uh, we looked at some of the, the basics behind Whirlpool, which is Samurai Wallet's implementation that is embedded into Sparrow Wallet's uh, desktop wallet. Uh, we talked about um, this kind of cautionary note that we are starting to see third-party platforms uh, reject deposits if they suspect that they have been mixed. And so that's an awful development for the ecosystem. But it's something to be aware of, right? Be thoughtful about how you do this and perhaps you, know, you mix part of your stack and leave a part uh, unmixed. Um, it remains to be seen how some of this plays out. But we then looked at the uh, actual kind of implementation in Sparrow and did a full walkthrough. So I'm curious to hear, what do you think? What are your thoughts on all these topics as it relates to privacy? Um, you know, what would you like to see covered in future videos? I really do take that into account when making the schedule for the channel. Uh, but we'll, for now, we'll go ahead and leave this video here. I hope you found this useful and valuable. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like and let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. But for now, we'll go ahead and end this. As always, my friends, every sack counts, especially if you've broken the deterministic links that bound it to its input. And until next time, I'll see you then.